This morning's reading will be brought to us from Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Good morning, church, and greetings to all those who are joining us online. It's always a pleasure to stand before you and share a few thoughts um, from the scriptures. And uh, last month of May, today being the first week of the month, sorry, please, in the last month of April, today being the first week of the month of May, we um, had gone through um, the various stages of growth, and uh, I do not need to repeat all that has been said, but in the month of May, our central team shall dwell around growing through trials. Growing through trials, and you ask me, how can you grow um, in the midst of trials? Um, we all very, all very well know what growth is. Um, uh, it's a form of increase, and so. Um, but if we look at it, if we say increase in what? Increase in size, then we'll be talking about probably physical growth. But we're looking beyond the physical, we're looking at spiritual, so increase in the size of what? In your knowledge, in your ability to rightly divide the word of truth, in your maturity, just like we've heard from the spiritual infant to the spiritual child, um, a spiritual adult and spiritual parents. Um, trials on its own um, could be said to be um, to determine the suitability or the performance of someone. And if you ask me, um, that looks more like an examination. And so, we all go through one form of examination or test or the other. As students, we have to go through these um, various stages of um, examinations to progress from one stage to the other. I mean, if you have to move from, state, from uh, grade level five to grade level six or seven or eight, whatever it is, there's some form of test that you have to do. And it is not anything different in the spiritual life. There are um, uh, tests that have to um, come our way in the forms of trials this time around. And so, as Christians, how can we harness trials for our spiritual growth? Um, uh, we can see from the book of James what James talks about um, trials. It says, it reads, Consider a pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. So, why should it be considered joy when you face trials of many kinds as children of God? We, I know we all kind of have a kind of mindset of what trials, trials look like. But said, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And what is perseverance? It's your ability to continue to do something in the face of opposition, in the face of failure, in the face of disappointments, in the face of obstacles. Your continuous strive to be a better child of God, despite the distractions we see all around us. When we keep moving forward, taking one step at a time, that is what is called perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And so in other words, as Christians, trials can be seen, can be used, or can be seen as a way we can grow spiritually. 
I want us to talk, look at the character in the scriptures. Abraham. We all know the story of Abraham. We know how um, uh, Abraham looked so much to have a child of his own um, uh, before um, Ishmael came in, which was not the plan of God for him. And in his 90s, Abraham was able to have Isaac. Can you imagine a man having his first child, so to speak, in his 90s, when he's supposed to be a great grandpa? And that is when he's now a pa. And God, like the Bible says, God tested Abraham. And not only that, God tested Abraham, the way the Bible put it makes it very tempting. Abraham, take your only your your son, your only son whom you love. I mean, why not just sacrifice your son? Why all this emphasis on trying to remind Abraham that this is just the one gift that I have given to you? And as soon as God gave that command to Abraham, Abraham never hesitated, according to the records of the scriptures. Abraham got up, packed his load. The next morning, he got onto his donkey and headed out for the place God wanted him to build an altar and make the sacrifice. On their way, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, he said, yes, my son. Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham responded, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. That was a statement of faith. And at the same time, it could also be seen on his face as him lying to his son, Isaac. Because probably he knew nothing better than we have the wood, we have the fire, but there's no lamb. And so what's going to happen? But as they progress, look at what happened here. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar. I can imagine, I can't imagine what was going through in the mind of Isaac when his father took rope and bound him and put him on the altar. But this man just said to me a while ago that God will provide. Does it mean that I'm the provision? Abraham exhibited a greater faith by not doubting God's providence, by not doubting what he had made, the pronouncement he had made. He went on and he wasn't kidding. Then he reached out his knife and took the knife to slay his son. He actually was not kidding. He reached out his knife, took the knife to slay his son. So we find that out When we as children of God go through trials and overcome trials, it's like an athlete who does a high jump. The higher he goes, the stronger he becomes. You set the height at this, he huddles over it. Then the next one, you set it higher, he huddles over it. The next one, you set it higher, he huddles over it. That is the life of a Christian. Trials will always come, and as we huddle over these trials, that is how we grow from one stage of Christianity to the other. Going back to the topic of the day, God disciplined his children. Or rather, before that, I wanted to talk about what, going back to the topic of the day, God disciplined his children. I know that if I ask by show of hands, how many of us have been disciplined one way or the other. Probably, I hope I'm right, almost everybody will be raising up their hands. I can see Stefan raising up his hand. Almost everybody will be raising up their hands. But we kind of have a misconception of the word discipline and have a misplaced um, interchange of the word discipline with punishment. 
Discipline is a different thing. Let us look at what the scripture says about discipline. As parents, what kind of children would we raise without some form of discipline? And let's see what discipline says. The training of people to obey rules. You want to train people to obey rules. I personally, when I was growing up, I never loved to obey rules in the house. I wanted to live by my rules. I didn't think it was fair for the kids, my fellow friends in the campus, they could get away with certain things from their parents, and I couldn't get away with those things from my parents. I don't think it was fair. I didn't want that rule. And so look, people, kids generally don't like to obey rules. Infants don't like to obey rules. They like to, 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 to walk by their rules. Even adults sometimes don't like to obey rules. But look at what the scripture talks about discipline here. Have you completely forgotten his word of encouragement that addresses you as the father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the law's discipline. My son, do not make light of the law's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. The Lord disciplines the one he loves. And as older parents with grown-up kids, some of you who are here, you might have heard at one point in time or the other, your kids have said, oh, I didn't like what mom or dad did, his rules when I was growing up, but I think now that I'm a grown-up adult, uh, I kind of appreciate that. That was because as parents, we had love for these kids. When we were kids, we didn't know any better. We thought that the discipline that we were receiving was, at the least, probably our parents didn't like us. But that was not the case. Look at what Hebrew says again. Endure hardship as discipline. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. So when we undergo hardship or form of trial as children of God, God is treating us as his children. For what children are disciplined by their father? For what children are not disciplined by their father? What children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. That is what the Bible says talks about discipline. And not true sons and daughters of Christ. So no discipline seems pleasant at the time. But it's painful. Later on, it produces, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And so, discipline is a way of enjoying hardship. Simply put, our identity as children of God helps us to see his discipline as a way to cement our trust in him. Our identity as children of God helps us to see his discipline as a way to cement our trust in him. There are characters in the scriptures that talk about those who trusted God and endured present prevailing hardship, and it enhanced their trust in God. Esther was a Jew married to the king. When Haman plotted to eliminate the Jews, Mordecai, his uncle, got the message across to Esther. It was a big crime, an offense, for you to present yourself before the king if you were not someone at that time. An offense that is punishable by death. And when Mordecai brought up this message to Esther, you have to do something, otherwise our race will be raised. Well, it was a tough thing for Esther to do because she couldn't just see herself Presenting herself to the king without his consequence. 
manifesting. And so what did Esther do? Esther asked all the Jews to fast and pray for three days and three nights. Herself inclusive and all our officials. And what did she say after that? After the fasting, I will rise and go to the king. Even though it is against the law of the land, if I perish, I perish. She was willing to take that bold step in the face of this difficulty, in the face of this trial. What happened to Joseph? Joseph was in the house of Potiphar. Potiphar. And Potiphar made Joseph to be in charge of his household. But incidentally, Potiphar's wife had interest in Joseph and wanted to go to bed with Joseph. Well, if that was going to give Joseph a peace, why not? That was an easy way out for Joseph. But Joseph stood his ground and said, come on. My master, your husband, has put everything in this house in my control. Except you because you are his wife. How can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? <coughs> Considering where Joseph was coming from, probably one thing could have told him and he said, this is another ladder you can use to step to a greater height. But Joseph did not see, take the easier route out. What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were told to worship the image of gold that was made. And they said they could not just do that. And they presented themselves, they were brought before King Nebuchadnezzar. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, if you throw us into the furnace, our God is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us. But even if he does not deliver us, we're still willing to go into this fire. We will not worship your God. Can you imagine ordinary people standing in front of very powerful men and making bold declarations like this just to hold on to their faith? It is not enough to say, I will take a bullet for Christ. Yes, it is good to say, I will take a bullet for Christ. But it is more important to actually go ahead and take that bullet for Christ. One common feature with all these three characters I mentioned, or these three stories, was that they held on to their faith. They never wavered from their faith. They held strong to their belief. They had so much trust in their God. They did not go the way of the world. And so the question that was asked by Paul in the text we read, what is it that shall separate us from the love of God? What is it that shall separate us from the love of God? What is it that shall separate us from the love of God. I mean, we have all had times when we have had to question God in the face of difficulties, and myself inclusive. Very recently, we celebrated, uh, Philomena and I celebrated our 19 years wedding anniversary. More than half of those years we were married, 10 years, there was one consistent thing in our prayer. God bless us with children. Not even with children. Bless us with a child. At least one. More than half. This was prayer that was consistent with us every day for that 10 years. Our parents prayed on our behalf, even if God won't listen to us. The church prayed on our behalf. Friends and families prayed on our behalf. 
But for 10 years, God said, wait. And we didn't see that answer from God as wait. Rather, we saw the answer from God as he's not listening. And a lot of times, I can remember the words of this song from the morning. Run through my head. Lord, you seem so far away. A million miles it is today. Though I haven't lost my faith, but I must confess right now, it is hard for me to pray. Many of us have gone through difficult times and have questioned God, where are you? Are you really there for my good in this situation? Some are praying to have a job. And some are praying to change the job. Some are praying to have a life partner. And some are praying for the fruit of the womb. Some are praying and mourning from the death of their loved ones. And others are praying for healing. And the list goes on and on. And some, even in their prayers, their situation have not changed. While others, the situation have gone from bad to worse. The question remains, what is it that shall separate us from the love of God in all this? But we're told... I don't know. Yeah. And we know that in all these things, God works for the good of those who love Him. In all these things, in the face of all these difficulties, the scripture encourages us that God works for our good. In good times and in bad times. In happy moments and in sorrowful moments, whatever it is. And I ask myself, just a little over five years ago, I lost my mom. And I ask myself, what is the good in my losing my mom in all this? What is, the, what is my good there? And as if that was not enough, over a year ago, I lost my only sister. And I still ask myself, what is the good in this? But unfortunately, if I allow myself to be enclaved in this touch and in the wisdom of man, we know how the Bible describes the wisdom of man. It is foolishness in the sight of God. It is foolishness in the sight of God. Things like this should not make us run away from the faith. For we are more than conquerors. In the face of tribulations and trials, that is not when we should abandon the faith. In the face of tribulation and trials, that is not when we should abandon fellowship with one another. In the face of tribulation and trials, that is not when we should be farther from God. For these are disciplines that help us to progress from one spiritual stage to the other. This is the message, I freely bring, message of hope I freely bring to us today. That we, I don't know why it skips, that we should not lose faith. Sorry about that. Technology is messing up this time around. That we should not lose faith in, in our hope. Because what? All we need to do, I don't know, I need the help here, please. This clicker is not. Uh, okay. We should not lose faith in our hope. Because the how belongs to God. All we need to do is to decide on the what. 
Let us decide on the what and leave the how to God. And that is why in the book of Matthew, it tells us, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. That's what he told us not to worry about. But what did he ask us to worry about? We should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything shall be added unto us. Just like the four men, the four men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were taken captive by the Babylonians. These are men who had dedicated them, their lives to God, all their lives. Said so they could not understand why should we be taken captives by pagans? Why should we be taken captives by pagans? Look at the way the scripture described this young man. They were what? Some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. They were about the best of the Jews, but they were taken captive. But despite the fact that they were taken captives, these young men chose not to abandon their faith and they chose not to dishonor themselves by eating from the meal from the king's uh, table. How dare these young men talk to the chief of the king's officials and suggest to the chief what they want to do. How dare them make captives. And they told Asphenas, they said to him, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. How dare he make captive tell the captain, please, I don't want to eat from these massive delicacies you have put in front of us to groom us off so that we can be good fit to serve at the king's table or in the king's palace. How dare you talk to them, to the, to the captain like that? But because they have decided on the what and have left the how to God, the king's affairs did not query these guys. But instead, what did he say? I am afraid of my lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should you see? Why should he see you looking worse than yonder young men, young young men of your age? The king would have would then have my head off because of you. Do we think that Daniel and his guys had figured out how they could look better than their counterparts? who had an opportunity to be exposed to all kinds of meals, and they just, want, they just wanted to feed on vegetables and water? Do you think they had figured out how we can look better than these guys? I don't think they figured it out. They just had something in mind, and they just went with it. But you know what? God had it for them. And God caused the officials to show favor and compassion to Daniel. God caused the officials to show favor and compassion to Daniel. There is a hand in this life that drives the how, if only we can make our mind on the what. And their counterparts were even looking at them as people who were foolish. How can you leave this kind of meals? 
and you want to resign yourself to vegetables and water. And they were making gesture of them. But it's not any different today. When we're in the midst of our pairs and certain things come up and we choose to take a stand for Christ, they will laugh at us. People laugh at us sometimes. How can you choose that? How can you behave like that? It is important not to conform, conform to the pattern of the world. And let us not forget the message of the cross. It's like foolishness to those who are perishing. The message of the cross is like foolishness to those who are perishing. And that is why Jesus Christ admonishes us not to worry about the things of this world, the mundane things of this world, what to eat, what to drink, but focus our attention on those things that will help us to draw nearer to thee. And when we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then we will grow like what is called an agric fowl. I know a lot of us might not understand what I mean by that. And I'll put an explanation to that. An agric fowl is like when you have your free run here. Your free run is allowed to run around. And you have those ones that are, I don't know what name to call them, but they are kept in, in a particular room. Maybe John can help me with that name. They are kept in a particular room and fed separately and they grow really big. When we seek God and his righteousness, we will not only grow, but we will grow very big like that. When we leave the how in the hands of God, he will lead us in a way that will help us to be free from the struggles and make us not to worry about the struggles of this life. In conclusion, Romans chapter 8 verse 14 reads, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are called the children of God. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are called the children of God. I want to share a poem um, um, by this uh, author here. And I will read it to us. And I said to the man who stood at the gate, Give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, Go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hands of God. That shall be better to you, that shall be to you better than light and safer than known way. So I went forth, finding the hand of God, trod gladly into the light. And he leads me towards the hills and the breaking of the day in the lone east. A toddler who have just started learning how to walk and is on a walk with his dad does not have any sense of direction, neither does he have any sense of destination. As long as his hand bears in the hands of his father, he has the confidence that he is safe wherever his father leads him. Likewise for us, if we decide to let God lead us, he will lead us successfully, irrespective of the surrounding struggles. In summary, we should not take a step if he has not stepped. We should not go anywhere if he is not there. We should not say anything if he has not prompted. And we should not eat anything if he has not provided. Simply put, a God-led life. A God-led life will help us to appreciate the benefits of God's discipline on his children. I originally wanted us to close with a song titled In the Hollow of God's Hands. And the weddings were like, are like this. With my Savior, ever need a guide, ever need to guide me. I am safe, whatever may betide me, from the storm and the tempest 
he will hide me in the hollow of God's hands. But my understanding is that majority of us do not know that song. And I'm not trying to put the elder who is in charge of the worship ministry of which I'm a part of on the spot. But I'm thinking that that should be a song you should take as a project in the hollow of God's hands. But to close, we shall sing in Christ alone. My hope is found. He is my light, my strength, and my song. Thank you for your time, and shall we rise?